Hello, I'm Dr. Richard Becker in the Division of Cardiovascular Health and Disease and Heart, Lung, and Vascular Institute. I'm joined today by two colleagues, Dr. Nicole Brown and Dr. Grushin Veltman from Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center and the Heart Institute. We're going to be discussing a very, very important topic today, and that is congenital heart disease. Welcome to Scholar Vision. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's, let's talk about congenital heart disease. And for our, our viewers, let's, let's start by describing what it is. So Dr. Veltman, can you, in your perspective, tell us a little bit about what is congenital heart disease? Okay. So congenital heart disease is any structural defect of the heart uh, that arises really at the time of, of formation of the heart. So this is evident right from the get-go as the heart is formed, and it takes many different forms, uh, the simplest of which are typically septal defects, uh, where there's uh, a gap between the, atria, between the two atria, uh, leaving effectively a way for blood to move between the two atrial chambers. And the other common defect is a ventricular septal defect between the two ventricular chambers. But in essence, it's present from right early on during formation of the heart. Mm -hmm. And how common or uncommon is congenital heart disease? So it's the most common form of congenital malformation. And typically, uh, the uh, incidence is approximately 8 per 1,000 live births. So really very common. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Brown, uh, tell us a little bit about the diagnosis. It sounds to me as if one could make the, the diagnosis before birth, shortly thereafter, mm -hmm. or perhaps it would only come to attention later in someone's life. Is that mm -hmm. the case? Yes, actually all, all three cases can be the scenario. So embryogenesis of the heart is actually, you know, beginning very early in the, in the first trimester. And so uh, at that time it would be too difficult to tell. However, on a later ultrasound, around 20 weeks or so, when the OBs typically do an anatomy scan, they might find something that seems inconsistent with normal anatomy and in which um, they would then refer the patient to get a fetal echocardiogram by a cardiologist at Children's or um, those can also sometimes be done at other places such as the uh, OB facilities. And uh, if they are able to prenatally diagnose a congenital heart defect, they mm -hmm. would receive counseling for, from a cardiologist. Sometimes they'll also even meet a surgeon before the baby's even born. And uh, that allows us to prepare for what to do for that child immediately after birth. Um, if, if the diagnosis is not made at the time of um, uh, gestation, then they can still <coughs> often find the defect immediately after birth due to a murmur, due to cyanosis or the baby being blue, or um, symptoms of heart failure. And if that's the case, then uh, the baby may need surgery early in life. Uh, they may need medication prior to or and after that. Um, and those babies typically will you know, need lifelong follow-up uh, also, there are some defects that are more on the simple end of the range that may not present until later in life, in later childhood or even adulthood. And that doesn't mean that it wasn't there before. It's just that the patient perhaps was mm -hmm. compensated enough that they didn't require immediate attention for the defect. Yes. Dr. Veltman, I'm, I'm not a, a pediatrician, but my sense is that there's been incredible progress made in the diagnosis and the management of congenital heart disease. Is that the case? Yes, very definitely. And I think we have been the very fortunate recipients of an enormous amount of technology. And probably for us, the most important uh, advancement has been really that in ultrasound. So the resolution of the ultrasound machines, <coughs> excuse me, has really been quite extraordinary in the last uh, two decades. And that has transformed the way that we can diagnose uh, these lesions. And Dr. Brown has already spoken about uh, the ability to diagnose antenatally. And of course, early on now, uh, most of our diagnoses can occur via ultrasound. On a different level, MRI scans and also um, uh, in the catheterization laboratory, we have enormous ability uh, to now finesse and fine tune eye diagnoses um, so that we can really form a very complete assessment of what the particular lesion is and furthermore allowing us then to really risk stratify as to what kind of risk might be associated with surgery or with a catheter-based intervention 
or as for many people is appropriate of course to leave uh, uh, the patient for the moment uh, and not have any surgery or intervention but perform active surveillance to see when the right time is for intervention. Yes. I'm going to ask you a question about Cincinnati Children's Hospital mm -hmm. and the, the program that mm -hmm. you've developed there. You know, my observation is that it, it is quite u unique. Mm -hmm. You could each give me your impression and to share with some of our viewers what's so unique ab about it and what, what allows it to stand uh, alone. Sure. Um, I think probably the most <coughs> unique thing about Cincinnati Children's Hospital is the fact that uh, we have a very robust team. So we have uh, four physicians who practice adult congenital heart disease, but we don't act alone. We have nurse practitioners, nurses, um, staff that are trained in cardiology and in congenital heart disease that help us provide a comprehensive care for our patient. Um, other services would include uh, a social worker dedicated to our adult population. Um, obviously, I'm, I speak more to the adults because that's who I take care of, but the same exists in a very comprehensive fashion for the children as well, of course. Um, and so they, there's a wide range of services that are available from management of their congenital heart disease to also management of heart failure, electrical diseases associated with the heart, um, interventional uh, specialists and surgeons who are highly trained in congenital heart defects. And so I think having all of those services available in addition to ancillary services that we need such as uh, nutritionists, um, subspecialty care, liver, kidney, uh, vascular, both with, within Cincinnati Children's and also in our collaboration with you and other facilities where we have good adult um, care that we can support our patients in those various needs that they have. So. Yes. Dr. Veltman, what's, what's so unique about yeah. Cincinnati Children's and your program? Yeah, and uh, I think for me the outstanding thing is really the history associated with Cincinnati. And, uh, and Rick, as you know, the uh, congenital heart surgery started here very early, back in the early 50s actually. And the close collaboration between the university and uh, with uh, Children's Hospital at that stage meant that the first application of ECMO was possible actually in 1951, uh, as early as that. So VV ECMO was given to an adult patient right here. And so um, the uh, extremely uh, fortunate heritage that we had with James Helmsworth, uh, with Sam Kaplan, uh, who were some of the early pioneers right here, um, uh, working from children's but closely collaborating uh, uh, with the university as well. Um, had then set the stage really for developing a program that's become truly unique and that's got a lot of history behind it. And, uh, and so from the adult congenital heart disease point of view, in this region, which is really quite unique, is that uh, there have now been over the years, uh, since the early 50s, so many patients that have come through the service, that have been served by the service, um, and so we think, uh, you know, there's probably of the order of nine or 10,000 patients that have uh, been operated on and are now in adult life. But that's given us a really unique perspective and a unique feel as a program because we've got this heritage uh, right here. And uh, so we feel very proud of that. Yes. Mm -hmm. I want to f follow up on something that you mentioned about the, the region and the number of, of people that have been touched by your, your program. Uh, I suspect that there are more than just a few people in our region and beyond our, our region who have had care mm -hmm. but have not had uh, the follow-up uh, that Dr. Brown mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. So am I Am I right about that? And if so, mm -hmm. what can we do to make sure that mm -hmm. those individuals, even though they might be feeling well right now, mm -hmm. don't stray too far, that they stay a part of this very, very important team that's been assembled? I think first, before I think discussing how to address it, I think it is important to highlight what a huge problem that is, um, being lost to follow up. And it's certainly something that in a proactive and prospective fashion, we're trying to address and uh, encourage uh, both patients when they're still with their pediatric cardiologist and as they become, when they come back into care with us, that this is a lifelong disease and that this is not something that is ever cured. We don't use the word fixed most of the time. Sure. Um, some diseases are simply palliated, some require multiple surgeries, but there are always consequences and sequelae down the line that require follow-up. Um, so uh, to highlight what an issue um, 
it is. We don't have as good of data here, unfortunately, but in the Canadian population where uh, medical record numbers carried with you throughout the entire nation, uh, we know that a little less than 40% of patients who received pediatric cardiology care and cardiac surgery uh, were still in care by the time they were young adults, and college age even. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that and, that, and those patients were not deceased. They had been in care in other places, in an ER with a primary care physician or elsewhere. And so I think you know, knowing more than half potentially, mm -hmm. at least more than half of our patients are out there without potentially yes. receiving appropriate care. Yes. Um, and that's, you know, that's a st statistic that we significantly want to improve, obviously, because uh, we, we feel uh, we have an obligation to these patients to, uh, we, we got them through their pediatric surgery, we feel an obligation to get them as far as we can beyond that and to have successful lives both mm -hmm. in their home life, work life, uh, reproductive life, and, and beyond. So, um, so that is the, the issue. And then in terms of uh, how we're addressing it, certainly uh, even within the pediatric division of our cardiology field, we, are, uh, we have sort of committees set up to address how do we keep patients in care. And we have a really good um, team of people who are reminding patients, hey, you missed your appointment, you need to come back in. You have been, been seen for three years, you need to come back in. But all that does rely on us having a correct demographic data of the patients, which is a, which is a challenge sometimes. Yes. Andrik, I wonder if I can speak to that as well, because I think this is really a key issue, uh, really very important. And I think one of our challenges is very much on the patient's behalf. Many believe that they've been cured, and uh, that's what they've been told in the past. And then from the uh, physician's perspective, um, if you don't know about congenital heart disease and the intricacies uh, very often, you also don't know where to seek additional help. And I think adult congenital heart disease as a specialty has come on so much in the last decade that in fact now it's recognized as an entire subspecialty exactly like heart failure or valvular heart disease and that there are now centers uh, and facilities that are really working specifically uh, towards accreditation in congenital heart disease, adult congenital heart disease, and that are able to offer uh, uh, this service. And we very much believe we want to make physicians, cardiologists aware that this service exists and that they, um, that it's available to them. And I think this would uh, really allow patients then the ability to benefit from all the advances that we spoke about earlier, but also some of the specialist and subspecialist care that can be offered in the context of uh, some uh, program dedicated to adults with congenital heart disease. Yes. Well, that's, that's wonderful, and I want to congratulate you both uh, on being a, a part of something that's very, very special as part of the, the history of children's. Um, Certainly the, the goal is the laudable goal is awareness, mm -hmm. public awareness, mm -hmm. to be able to identify individuals, provide the best possible care as a part of a continuum of, of care, even as mm -hmm. they become teenagers mm -hmm. and adults and older adults that yeah. we need to make sure mm -hmm. that they, they don't go too far, that they're, they're part of uh, this organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd like to thank Dr. Nicole Brown and Dr. Grushin Veltman from Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, the Heart Institute, and the Congenital Heart Disease Program for joining us today on Scholar Vision. You've heard just a little bit about a program that has been established and has flourished over the years, serving the people of Cincinnati, the region, the country, and beyond. Until our next episode of Scholar Vision, keep asking questions. Inquiry is the true compass of scientific and medical advance.